Emotions are just the spice of life. It is just the flavor of life. It doesn't add anything to life. And some of us are where we are today because we are so emotionally charged off. We just can't forgive somebody that hurt us. Uh, uh, a situation happened in your life, you just can't let it go. Emotionally, you are so holding on to it, you are so charged, you can't just release it. But God wants you to see better days. And I want you to turn to somebody and say, your best days are in front of you. So take charge. And if you are on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, I want you to type it in the chat room because you guys are here with us. Type it, your best days. My best days are in front of me. So I got to take charge. That is what God wants you to do. He wants you to take charge because your best days are in front of you. And I tell you what, the enemy is lurking around. He wants to make sure that you don't have those best days. So he's going to work your emotions and make sure that you allow your emotions to get the best part of you. But God wants you to have victory in your emotions. Hmm. Glory to God. I want to share some few thoughts with you this morning. And uh, <clears throat> like we, we shared last week, I, I was reading a story of the uh, founder of Cash Up, the guy who founded Cash Up. And, and like I shared with you last week, the guy that killed him, killed him because he, he got angry because he felt this guy introduced his sister to drugs. And so even though they were home having, you know, conversations, they, they talked him down. And it, it, it felt as if everything was calmed down. And that is a danger of unresolved emotions. When you are angry with somebody and you don't talk to the person about it, and you keep it, you bottle it, you bottle it. After a while, it explodes. And so even though they had a conversation in this girl's apartment, and then, you know, they, when it was all done, his killer said, how about I give you a ride? <laughs> Without realizing that a guy took one of the kitchen knives with him. Emotions. Emotions is a terrible thing. It can make you do things that you never thought you could do. Yeah. That is what the Bible says. Emotions that are negative, that are not of God, must be dealt with within 24 hours. And today I'm able to say some of these things because I know what it means to hold on to it for an extended period. It will kill you. It will hurt you. It will send you to prison. It will make you things that you will look at yourself and be like, man, did I really do that? Yes, you did. Because you did not manage your emotions. This morning, God wants us to get some few things that will help us. I want us to look at a few things because somebody will ask, what are emotions? First of all, emotions are like I said, a spice of life, it doesn't really add anything. And none of us would ever grow on emotions. We cannot grow on spices, flavors, because that is all it is. Real food is what you want to eat, the word of God. And a good number of us are excited about the emotional part of everything and not the substance. Just like this morning, look at the time of worship. There was emotions all over the place. People were excited, worshiping God, singing about God. But what good is it when you have all this beautiful feeling because uh, Sister Rosalind is leading us in this powerful time of worship. And, and so you have this overdose of emotions during the time of worship and you never took time to really do what the word says. But that is what we do all day. We get emotionally charged. We, 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 we are so high on emotions. And a lot of people come to church just for the emotions. We don't come because we want to receive the word. Emotions are also the appreciators of life. We respond to the national anthem, for instance, when the national anthem is being sung. I see people even shed tears just because they play the national anthem. They shed tears. That is emotions. Or imagine your little baby taking their first steps. That can really get you emotional. Yeah. <laughs> so we all, everybody listening to me, I believe we all share, you know, emotional situations in life, but the substance of life is in the situation itself, not just the emotions. But then we sometimes, you know, get stuck with the emotions and forget that there is substance that we got to pay attention to. And a lot of believers, a lot of Christians go off track because we focus so much on the emotions rather than the substance. 
which is happening right around us. Now, I want to start off today with a story in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> I know a lot of us know <clears throat> this story in the book of Genesis chapter 4. And I want to read from verse number 2. Am I talking to people that have emotions? Well, I do have. I get angry. I get happy. I get sad. I get frustrated. Give me the New Living Translation if you have it. You know, sometimes we, we become surprised when certain groups of people express emotions. Uh, many years ago, I watched the interview of Mrs. Billy Graham. And she was being asked, how has marriage to the man of God been? We assume it's been great because you guys have been married for so long. Uh, have you ever, in the course of your relationship, contemplated divorce? And she took in a deep breath. And you, you would expect some positive and great comment from such a great woman of God who has been married to the greatest man of God, supposedly. You know, we, we call him America's evangelist. So the wife looks at the journalist and said, well, I haven't really contemplated divorce, but I can tell you that on a few times I've contemplated killing him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Billy Graham's wife. That is why you don't marry somebody because you are emotionally attached to them or emotionally attracted to them. Because the person you are emotionally attracted to on many times during one day will show up to be like an enemy you feel like punching in the face so you cannot enter into a relationship just on a basis of emotions and the reason is because none of us can sustain any of those emotions neither can we sustain the things that brings us to those state of emotion if i'm doing something that is making you feel happy to be with me i cannot sustain that all day all week all month all year all throughout my life so if that is the only reason why you want to be with me, I promise you that you're going to be disappointed every day, every week, every month, every year, and throughout the relationship, because none of those things can be sustained. It's a fantasy. So marriage is a choice. It's a decision. I make a decision to spend the rest of my life with you. It's not because of the way I feel about you. It's a decision. It's the type of love God has for us. That is why you cannot do anything to increase that love God has for you. And there is nothing you do on your Wednesday. His love for you is still the same. And that is the kind of love God wants you to have in your relationship. It's called agape. God's kind of love. Unconditional. It's not conditioned on anything. There is nothing you do which becomes the reason why I love you. I love you because I love you. I love you because I want to love you. That is the love of God, which he wants us to enjoy in our relationship. Look at what the Bible says here in Genesis chapter 4. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. This is talking about Eve, her second born. Let's read on verse number 3. What does the Bible say? When it was time for harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Number four, we're going to read a bunch of scriptures, so let's keep going. Abel also brought a gift, the best. Say the best. Yes. Abel also brought a gift, the best portion of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift. Did you see that? God accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very emotional. Anger. Why would we both bring a gift to God? And he said, thank you to me with excitement. He's like, okay, thank you. The way he expressed joy over your gift was better than the way he expressed gift, his joy towards my gift. But in this case, it's even worse off. But he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected, meaning depressed. Number six. Now, God comes into the situation to let him know that I feel you, bro. I see you upset, but I want you to know you got to do something about this. Most of the time, we don't talk about this part that in between he getting angry and killing his brother, there was a conversation God had with him. God sat at 
table with him and gave him counseling. Now, bro, you got to deal with this anger issue here. So God suddenly didn't wait for a moment. Bible says God comes on a scene and says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? And like church folks would do every time. Look at his response. God continues to say, well, you know what? You will be accepted. You know, I would have accepted your gift if you did a right. You know what you brought is not what it's supposed to be. You don't bring me sacrifices of convenience. You bring me sacrifices that I want. You brought me the fruits of the land because you're a farmer and that was the easiest thing to do. No, you know that is not what I want. I want blood. And you know the precedence. You know the rule that every sacrifice to me must be with the life of the thing because the life of everything is in the blood. And so if you are bringing me something that has no life, it is dead. And he knows very well because God himself was the one that set the precedence. God was actually the first person that killed an animal as a sacrifice. And so they knew it. Adam knew it. Eve knew it. And so I believe they would have taught their children. But Cain decided to do what he wanted to do, like church folks today. Everybody wants to do what they want to do. Don't we do that all day? We do that all day. You are an usher. An usher is supposed to serve us. Is that correct? An usher is supposed to serve us. And I've never, throughout my entire working in the hospitality, I've never seen any restaurant that puts on their door. We open at 4 p.m. I get there at 4.15 and they tell me the waiters are not here. Can you sit down and wait for them? You are not ready to serve. Check out. Check out with your nasty attitude because God doesn't want it. A server does what servers do. Servers come to wait on the customers. And Jesus is the standard. You cannot be a follower of Jesus when you don't have a heart to serve. And this is the painful truth that pricks the heart. This is the painful truth church folks don't want to hear. And I will preach it till I die. I would not change the word of God because of your emotions. It is the word of God. God will never adjust for you, for me, for us. The person that needs to do the adjustment is you and me. A lot of us are trying, oh, let us pray to provoke the hand of God. Ah, he's called sovereign. You don't understand the sovereignty of God. You are not ready to serve. If you cannot come to wait on the people of God, and I'm speaking to everybody that serves in this church. You are an usher. You're a singer. You're a pastor. You're a minister. I'm a pastor here. I come to serve you. So I must be here before you come. That is my mindset. I know there are churches that have green rooms. You know what a green room is? The place you go to sit whilst you're waiting for the show to start. And whilst you're waiting in that room, they serve you with tea, coffee, juices. And then finally, whoever is in charge, maybe the stage manager will say, get ready. In five minutes, we'll be going live. And then whoever is doing your makeup for you will do your makeup, get you ready. And then when it's five minutes, they play a promo. And then bam, 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 you show up. You take the mic and do your show. We're not here to do a show. Listen to me. When we come to church, every single one of us are actors. There is only one audience. His name is Jesus. None of us come here to enjoy what goes on here. He's the reason for the service. He's the reason for the gathering. And so we come to serve him. Whatever role you play, some of us have nasty attitudes that must go away. And it's all because of our emotions. That's why I'm going to teach these things because we got to grow as a church. Emotions must be out of the window. It's so amazing when we go to work, we turn off. It's as if we have a switch. We turn off our emotions. But when we come to church, we go, pla, 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 turn all the emotional emotions. She makes me upset. She makes me angry. I'm not coming to church again. Why don't you do that with your job when you're abused? You are cursed at. Your office F-bombs are flying all over the place. And Monday, you are the first to punch in. You can't even wait for 8 o'clock to start. You punch in 10 minutes and your supervisor is fighting with you. Why do you clock in so early? Because you love the money. 
more than God. We are so messed up, people. We so messed up. We are the biggest of hypocrites. We so messed up. And we want to see the glory of God. We want to see the hand of God in our lives. We want to have a turn around. And our lives is a kind of worm. Every single one of us, nobody exempted, including myself. We got to turn around if we want to see the glory of God. No wonder the world is pointing fingers at the church. They call themselves a Christ, Christian. They call themselves believers. We got to have a turn around in our lives. We don't represent the Christ we claim to represent him. You know what God says? They speak about me with their mouth, but their hearts are far away from me. Because if your hearts are close to him, you will do the things he's called you to do. He says, if you will love me, you would obey my commandment. Church, we want to see growth. We want to see a turnaround. We want to see this community taken over for Christ. It must start from us. We are busy for praying for the, for, for the White House to change. The White House is not going to change until the church of Jesus Christ changes. Revival must begin from the church house before it can hit the White House. We want to turn around in the White House, but the church house is not turning around. There must be a change. So God comes and says, Ken, I got to have a meeting with you. Your will be accepted, just like I accepted Abel and his sacrifice, if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. He says, if you don't fix this hurt, anger, bitterness, jealousy, all this offense and things, he says, if you don't fix it, I want you to know sin is sitting right at your door. Sin. Sin. The next thing that happens after you don't address anger, hurt, all this negative emotion, it's called sin. And God is the one that came and counseled him that, look, I know you're upset because I accepted your brother and I didn't accept yours, but you know why I did that because you know what is right and if you did the right thing, you would have been cool. But guess what? You still have an opportunity to fix this situation. Go deal with the anger, jealousy in your heart. You are jealous because I accepted your brother's uh, gift and I didn't accept. Go deal with it. Go deal with the anger. Because if you don't, oh, I love Jesus. Jesus says, you know what? The devil is coming and he finds no place in me. And that is why the Bible says that do not let a son go down on your anger. And then he goes on to say, so that you don't give no place for the devil. Because when you continue over an extended period to walk in anger, all these negative emotions, you give a breathing ground for the devil. So God says you would have been accepted if you did what was right, but you refuse to do what is right. And people are like that, just stubborn. Nothing changes them. And sometimes we think the other person that hurt us is a problem. No, you are the problem. Yes, they did what they did, but you have power over your emotions. And last week I made a statement. I said, if people's behavior still offends you, then you have some maturing to do. Because real maturity is when I get to a place, none of the things, none of the craziness you're doing affects me. Then I can say I've really gone past that place. But we are still at a place where every little thing. And I said a while ago, if you are going on a journey, Pastor Helen, if you are going on a journey and every dog that backs, you take a stone and throw, you will never get to where you're going. But that is what some of us do. Every step of the way, somebody has offended you. And you want to deal with it. Then you can never get to that place. You must learn to avoid your distractors. Mm, they are distractors. You must tell yourself, you know what? I don't care what this person is trying to do in my life. I'm going to focus on that which God has done, asked me to do. And I'm going to pursue that. I'm going to do that. I'm not doing it for this person. I'm doing it for the Lord. And so none of the things they are saying and doing is going to stop me from doing it. Well, what?